10 Buffalo Bills wide receiver free agent targets that I think could realistically be targeted. That's what we're talking about today on Talking Buffalo. And on that note, welcome everybody to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. My name is Patrick Moran. Thank you, as always, for watching, for listening, for following, for subscribing. I appreciate you all very, very much. Um, free agency is coming, and we all know the biggest hole right now on the Buffalo Bills is wide receiver. We all know that the Buffalo Bills are in pretty shitty salary cap shape. So we all know that the Buffalo Bills are not going to go out and spend 15 to $20 million or maybe even more annually on another wide receiver via free agency. It's simply not in the cards. What I've done, and I'm going to get to these in just a few minutes here, is I compiled a list, and these are all my own personal uh, opinions here. A list of 10 wide receivers out there that are, as of this recording, at least anyway, due to become free agents that I could see the Buffalo Bills and Brandon Bean uh, realistically taking a stab back. And to get to that in just a quick second, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes real quick here. Last two episodes of Talking Buffalo have been really, really good. If you missed them, make sure you go back and check them out. On Monday's show, I had Joe from Queens who had not been on the podcast for over eight and a half months. We had a major falling out between the two of us. Lots of beef. Um, anyway, he returned to the show on Monday, spent a chunk of the time talking about what that beef was, and then we got into some uh, Bills and Sabres stuff. It's good to have Joe back on the show. You know, he says <laughs> uh, and tweets out some pretty crazy shit, but I'll tell you, at the end of the day, um, I respect his, his honesty. Um, he's a great listen or a great watch, depending on how you consume this show. So I'm just happy to have him back on. So that was on Monday. And then on yesterday's show, I had Brian Cozio from WGR 550. Um, we talked about the Sabres, uh, Brian's job as, um, a, a game night reporter for WGR Sabres, intermission reports, post game reports, how frustrating it is year after year. Um, you know, reporting on a losing team and having to deal with callers. Just a lot of fun stuff. A really good Mike Evans take as well from uh, from Brian. So make sure you go check that out. In terms of some actual Buffalo Bills news right now, uh, so I'm recording this Tuesday early afternoon. Um, Ian Rappaport from NFL Network reported on Tuesday morning that the Bills converted uh, offensive guard Connor McGovern's contract guaranteeing his money now for 2024 into a signing bonus. They added two void years. And as a result, the bills are saving about 3.7 more, or I'm sorry, 3.74 million against the 2024 salary cap. So we know the bills, again, a team that's going to come up with ways, whether it's restructuring guys, whether it's a couple of releases, the bills got to get down um, and better salary cap shape. So it's starting now. Connor McGovern is the first to actually be publicly announced. Also, I thought uh, of interest here, Sean McDermott on Monday. So the NFL scouting combine is this week. And on Monday, Sean McDermott met with the media. And something that kind of stood out to me is flying a little bit under the radar right now was a direct quote that Sean had regarding being the head coach and his coordinators. And this is the quote. I'm going to read it. It says, but it's also time for me to do a little bit of, hey, okay, I have two young coordinators and special teams coordinator Matthew Smiley is a little more veteran in his role. And age-wise, McDermott said, it's not in any way because I don't think I can't do the job defensively, but it's more of let me lead from a different position and let me put a big picture perspective on things and a 10,000 foot view at times. My interpretation of that quote from Sean McDermott, and he hasn't come out and said this um, officially, but when the Bills promoted Bobby Babbage to the defensive coordinator, I think one of the first things we all wondered was Sean McDermott going to continue to call plays on defense, or was he going to hand those reins over to Bobby Babbage? When I listened to that quote, again, it's not in any way because 
I don't think I could do the job defensively, but it's more of a let me lead from a different position. When I hear that, that leads me to think that Bobby Babbage is going to take over play calling duties for the Bills in uh, 2024. And Sean McDermott is going to kind of go back to more of a CEO style of coach who just oversees everything. I like that personally, although to be fair, I think Sean McDermott did a pretty damn good job of calling defense for the Bills uh, this past season. I mean, of course, the defense fell apart in the loss to Kansas City in the playoffs, but I think injuries had plenty to do with that, and that was just execution. I really didn't have a problem with uh, the defensive calls that Sean McDermott made. So anyway, those are a couple of Bills noteworthy items uh, going into this episode. In terms of free agency, look, I think on the offensive side of the ball, this is pretty clear cut. On the offensive side of the ball, there's going to be 10 starters back. The offensive line, as long as Mitch Morse returns, which I think he will, uh, the offensive line is set. A tight end is obviously set with Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox. Uh, you know, running back two, quarterback two, we'll see how those play out. But I don't consider those pressing needs. The Bills have lots of options, lots of inexpensive options. I'm sure Brandon Bean will find the right guys for that role. It is worth noting, I really, really, really would like to see the Bills resign High Johnson. I think he's the perfect number two back to James Cook. But anyway, my point is, that's they're not pressing needs. And when you look at this offense right now, it's um, it, it's one position, and that's it. And it's wide receiver. And everybody knows it. I mean, I'm not saying anything right now that you don't already know. The Buffalo Bills have got to improve at wide receiver for lots of reasons. Of course, because of your quarterback, Josh Allen, he just needs another good, trustworthy wide receiver to be able to throw the football to. But you can make a case. You know, we sit here and we pick apart why the Bills, you know, the season ended in the divisional round. And it's very easy to say the defense fell apart. And that's true. And it's very easy to say injuries were a factor. And that's also true. But the wide receiver position directly negatively influenced the Buffalo Bills in that loss to Kansas City. Not one, not two, but three drops down the field. Uh, One of them by Stefan Diggs, which, you know, you just, it's Stefan Diggs. You're going to have to eat that. You're going to have to live with it. But two by Trent Shurfield. That really hurt the Bills. And they have to be better than Trent Shurfield. It's as simple as that. Now, Gabe Davis was hurt. Again, going back to the injury thing, didn't play in the playoffs. And I like Gabe. I'm not going to come on this podcast today and just shit on Gabe Davis because we all know that he's going to end up somewhere else. Not going to do that. But that said, Gabe Davis, maybe he makes those catches, but maybe he doesn't. I mean... You know what Gabe Davis is. We've seen it over the last couple of years. Gabe Davis is a guy who'll get you four catches for a buck 30 and two touchdowns. Gabe Davis is also a guy that'll get you two catches or less, literally six, seven, eight times throughout the course of the season. That's just who he is. The Bills need to be better at this position. So despite the salary cap, despite the challenges that Brandon Bean's going to have, the Bills absolutely, positively need to invest resources, plural, not singular, in the wide receiver position. And to me, that comes both ways. That comes in the draft as early as a first-round pick at 28, no later than a third. The Bills need to get a wide receiver within the first two nights of the draft. It's as simple as that. Brandon Bean has done a lot of great things as Bills GM. But other than trading for Stefan Diggs, and he gave up a first to do that. So I know a lot of people like to cite the, the statistic that Brandon Bean has only drafted one wide receiver in the first four rounds since he's become GM, and that was Gabe Davis. But in fairness to him, I kind of consider Stefan Diggs a first-round draft pick because of what they gave up. But even that aside, 
Brandon Bean has not used a second or a third round pick on a receiver. I think that needs to change this year. But that alone is not enough. This is a team still in a championship window. And whether it's a first rounder or a second rounder or a third rounder, having a rookie ride receiver taking and instantly stepping in, becoming your number two player, becoming a guy that you're going to depend on for 45 to 60 catches for 600 to 900 yards and four to seven touchdowns. It's a big ask for a rookie. So I also think that the Bills need to address his position at wide receiver and free agency. Simple as that. You got Stefan back and he's still good. I know what happened in the back half of the year and I'm going to take a glass half full Joe Brady with an entire offseason as coordinator figuring it out a way to make Stefan Diggs a better football player than what he was in the back half of 2023. So anyway, you got Stefan and you got the emergence of Khalil Shakir who has turned into a, a gem at slot receiver. You know, it's funny, wide receiver is still a pressing need, but just imagine how pressing of a need it would be were it not for Khalil Shakir. My God. So anyway, besides those two guys, you got a rookie in Justin Shorter, and then you got a guy in Teontae Hardy who might not even be back next season, and then you got Trent Sherfield, who is a free agent, a guy who I was pretty high on and disappointed. I thought he had a very disappointing almost irrelevant 2023 season with the exception of a great play in Miami in the finale, which mattered, but just uh, an irrelevant player and a guy who hurt the Bills in the playoffs. So you need at least two receivers here in this unit. Um, there's a handful of guys that I know are popular players that, you know, we, we like to have, but I just don't think they're uh, realistic. Again, today's episode is about realistic Bills receivers targets. Michael Pittman, uh, T. Higgins, who's already been franchised now by Cincinnati, Marquise Brown, Calvin Ridley, Mike Evans. Those are guys that, as much as I would absolutely love to see them in a Buffalo Bills uniform, it's just it's not going to happen because, simply put, I don't think the Bills have the financial resources to be able to take a run at them. And I've been tweeting a lot about Mike Evans of late. The thought of Mike Evans on the Buffalo Bills with Stephon Diggs and the skill set that he would bring to this offense is quite literally the perfect fit. And I mean perfect. A perfect fit. But again, it's about money. And it sucks. Any other year, if Mike Evans even gets the free agency, I'd be all in on him. I really would. I think he could be the difference in this offense. I just imagine trying to stop an offense that can run the football that has Josh Allen and also has Stefan Diggs, Khalil Shakir, Dalton Kincaid, and Mike Evans. My God. My God. But anyway, that's just simply not going to happen. And then there's a list of a handful of guys that are you know pretty well known around the league, names that you've heard of. But they're just guys that I'm straight up not interested in. And it's not even about the money. You know, Pittman, Mike Evans, uh, Calvin Ridley, that's about the money. These guys, I'm just not really interested in. Um, Adele Beckham Jr. is one. Uh, DJ Chark, not a good route runner, doesn't get separation. I don't need that guy on my team. Darnell Moody from Chicago, I'm good on passing on him. And Chase Claypool, and I know that's a name, an early round pick who, you know, had some success with the uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers at one point, but I'm good with him too. We saw what he did in Chicago, nothing. We saw what he did in Miami this past season, nothing. Those aren't the kind of guys that I want to see in the Buffalo Bills. Here are though, 10 of them. And I'm going to fly through these. These won't be very long. A lot of these are names that you know relatively well. Some of them are guys that are going to be a little bit under the radar. Let me start with, and I want to, again, emphasize the word realistic here. My realistic number one priority for the Buffalo Bills in free agent, free agency, I'm sorry. Now, I don't even think just a wide receiver. I think period. Like if the Bills could bring in one free agent right now 
that is realistic and affordable. My pick is going to be Noah Brown from the Houston Texans. Um, PFF, their contract production has him at two years, three and a half million dollar average, three point seven five million guaranteed. Guys, twenty uh, twenty eight years old, six two, two fifteen, good size, good skill set, a good match for what the Bills need. Uh, last year, thirty three catches for five hundred sixty seven yards, two touchdowns. He averaged 17.2 yards per catch. He's averaged 13 and a half yards per catch for his career. Um, he just feels to me like a guy who's ready to break out right now. Seven receptions, by the way. I remember this game because I was scrambling to pick him up in every fantasy football league on the waiver wire that I was in last year in November uh, at Cincinnati. He had seven catches for a buck 72. I look at a guy like Noah Brown. And some of these receivers, if the Bills were to bring him in, they would be different fits. Like, there's a few of these guys who could come in and you want them to be what you thought Gabe Davis was going to be for you. And then you bring along a rookie and you could afford to bring him in a little more slower. In other cases, some of these guys that we're about to mention, they're kind of like tweeners, like Emmanuel Sanders was for the Bills. Uh, maybe to some extent, hopefully a little bit better about what Trent Churfield was for the Bills, where they're not, you're not really signing them to be your number two receiver, but they could play. They're capable of stepping in for drives, maybe even for a couple games and being a, a perfectly suitable uh, number two receiver. You draft a guy early in the draft at receiver and you're hoping that you're like legit number two. But these are guys, some of them who are, like I said, number threes or fours, but they could step up into a role if uh, if you need him to. Noah Brown, I kind of look at him, and he falls on that um, he falls on that Gabe Davis type side. Just in terms of I I think you sign him, he is without question, at least in my book anyway, a number two receiver. And if that money turns out to be even remotely accurate, uh, two years at about three and a half million per. <laughs> I'd be all over that. Again, my number one free agent priority. Number two, and this is a name I know Buffalo Bills fans know well, uh, Tyler Boyd, Cincinnati Bengals. He's 29 years old. Uh, signing him to me would be a commitment to him being your number two wide receiver because he's going to cost money. Uh, PFF has him two years, about $8.75 million average, uh, roughly about $11 million or so guaranteed. I kind of think is low. I actually think you see him getting more money. Uh, Spot Rack has him getting three years at about $26.1 million, so roughly the same average uh, per year. I think if you commit that kind of money to a, a veteran wide receiver, I feel like you're married to him being your, your number two wide receiver. Maybe, uh, maybe you're not drafting a wide receiver at 28 overall anymore if you, if you sign Tyler Boyd. Which, I mean, to be fair, who knows how long Stephon Diggs is going to be a Buffalo Bills. So I'm not saying that signing a Tyler Boyd means the Bills are not going to draft a receiver in the first round. I think it lessens the pressure to get a wide receiver in round one or maybe even round two if you go out and you get a Tyler Boyd. Uh, he's had 1,000 yards twice in his career, 2018, 2019. His production dipped some when the, Bill, or when the Bills, when the Bengals drafted T. Higgins. But even last year, still had 67 catches for 667 yards, uh, two touchdowns. And I, I don't know. I look at Tyler Boyd, and to me, he is just a straight-up upgrade over Gabe Davis. So get him. You go get yourself a day-two pick. And if you could do that, to me, I think wide receiver position at that point is just good. Uh, one more before the break here. Josh Reynolds of the Detroit Lions. Uh, BFF has him two years, 5.475 million guaranteed, an annual average of about five and a quarter. Uh, Spot Rack has him getting a two year, $14 million contract. And that number, I, I don't know, I, I think you're, you're virgin on too much because seven million a year in the Bills cap situation, I don't think you're paying seven million dollars a year unless you look at a guy and say, this guy is definitely good enough to be our number two wide receiver right now this year. Not quite sure that Josh Reynolds is that guy, but 
I do like him. He's a useful player. He's 29 years old. Good length. He's six foot three, 194. He can go up and get contested balls. Uh, I know the knock against him. Uh, a lot of people, had, including myself, to some extent, have a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth because he was critical in Detroit being not being able to hold the lead against the San Francisco 49ers. He had two monstrous drops in the NFC Championship game. Really, really hurt uh, the Detroit Lions. But that aside, man, 40 catches last year, 608 yards, three touchdowns. This kid's a good player. This kid is a, a good player. These first three guys feel good enough that if you, you have them in a wide receiver two role, like say a Gabe Davis, and then, like I said, you draft a guy maybe in the second or, or third round, I think your offense instantly, you know, is good. Uh, the rest of the guys we're going to get to right here after a quick break. These are more, like I said, of the Emmanuel Sanders, uh, the Trent Shurfield types that, they could give you a good production on any given Sunday, but you're not going to week in and week out be able to, to rely on it. So quick break, come back, and we'll run through a handful of those guys. All right, I am back, and today we are talking 10 Buffalo Bills realistic wide receiver uh, free agent targets. Keeping the train moving here. Uh, Nick Westbrook, a kid, a from uh, the Tennessee Titans. This guy is a lot of people would consider almost like another Gabe Davis, like a Gabe Davis clone. He's a really good field stretcher. He can get down the field and he's a good blocker, but he struggles in routes. He struggles to be able to, to get separation from the defender doesn't have the biggest route tree. Um, I looked at the stats or projection wise for PFF. One year, $2.75 million, all guaranteed. That's what PFF would project. I uh, had 29 catches last year, 370 yards, three touchdowns in 14 games. He was the number two receiver for Tennessee most of the season. Again, I would not hate this signing whatsoever. I wouldn't hate it at all. Uh, Stefan Diggs, Akine, Shakir, the rookie. It's tough really to go over wide receivers because you don't know what's going to happen in the draft. You don't know how low the Bills are going to go or how high, I should say, the Buffalo Bills are going to go with their draft pick. But like I said, to me, worst case, I feel like this guy would be an upgrade over a Trent Shurfield. And if those contract projections, if that's even remotely right, under $3 million, Almost kind of feels like that could be a priority type of signing for, for Brandon Bean. Another guy here that I know a lot of uh, people have heard of, at least anyway, Van Jefferson. I uh, played with the Falcons last year. Spot rack has him at one year, $2.35 million. Uh, he's six foot one, 200 pounds. He's done some good things before. Just a couple of years ago, 2021 with the Rams, he had 50 catches for 802 yards. And six touchdowns. So you take those stats and those numbers from last year. And I said, you can go get yourself a receiver in free agency. Even if it comes close to that, 50 catches, 800 yards, six touchdowns. I feel like we would all sign up for that rather quickly. So Van Jefferson is a, a name to keep an eye on. Somebody who's kind of fallen off the last couple of years, but somebody who's done it before, who's not old, and who could come in here and potentially be a, a pretty good fit for the Buffalo Bills. I don't love Van Jefferson, but I but I like him. I, I wouldn't be mad at that at all. All right, here's a name that I know people have heard of because there was a time where he was one of, if not the best wide receivers in the entire NFL. He was a top five fantasy football pick every year. You know, in an era where it was always running back, running back, running back, Michael Thomas would constantly be among the top five picks in fantasy football. Uh, it sounds like he's been around forever because he's been hurt so much. Um, but he's going to be 31 years old when the season starts. So basically the same age as Stefan Diggs. Uh, PFF projects him to get a one-year, $8 million contract. Six and a half of that would be guaranteed. Uh, I feel that's too much. But if that price could get a little bit lower, feels like that could be a good short-term fit for the Bills. 
You know, I look at a guy like Michael Thomas, and let's just say he's healthy, which is a, could be a stretch. And, I, you know, I look at the Saints, too. I mean, they got good young weapons. Chris Olave emerged. Got a good tight end, Juwan Johnson. Got Kamara running the football. I don't know if Michael Thomas fell off a cliff. I think it might have been just the Saints got some good young skill position players, and that might have cost, at least to some extent anyway, Michael Thomas's production to dip. So I kind of look at a, at a Michael Thomas and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if this guy could be what John Brown, best case scenario, what John Brown was for the Buffalo Bills um, when Brandon Breen brought him in in, in 2019. I had 39 catches last year, 448 yards in 10 games. Hasn't been great since 2019. In 2019, he led the NFL in receptions. He had 149 receptions, 1,725 receiving yards. Um, yeah, I guess at the end of the day, I look at him and I'm like, if the Bills were to sign him, he's an upgraded, if he could stay healthy, like an upgraded version of what Emmanuel Sanders was at that point in his career when he came to the Buffalo Bills and he could maybe even help mentor a rookie. If you bring in Michael Thomas, it's not long-term. So I don't think that eases up the pressure of having to get a receiver early in a draft. And I want to be clear, no matter what the Bills do at receiver here, I am not advocating that even if they get a Tyler Boyd or even if they get a Noah Brown, I'm not suggesting that the Bills don't take a wide receiver early. If the right one's there, even in the first round, but having a guy who's established, who's a good receiver, maybe that makes Brandon Bean not need to reach as much for a receiver, taking one just for the sake of taking one. People can deny it, but I think to some extent in 2022, that's what happened with Kyrie Elam. Corner was such a need and it was not addressed that when the Bills got to the draft, they were going to take a corner almost no matter who it was in the first round. So, what I'm saying is by having a good receiver, maybe that makes you be able to wait if the right guy's not there, if you don't feel that that value is there. I don't know. Michael Thomas is a guy. I don't hear a lot about him anymore. And again, the injuries, uh, the decline in production. But I think in this case, I actually think he could be a good fit uh, for the Buffalo Bills. A few more here. Uh, LaVisca Chenault, um, most recently with the Carolina Panthers, made a um, $1.9 million with Carolina last year. Been kind of a bust. Kind of a bust. Second round pick to uh, Jacksonville back in 2020. Uh, last year, he was bothered by a bad ankle, ended up on IR. Only had 10 catches for 60 yards. This could be, you know, if, if the Bills, you know, lock in on a guy like LaVisca, man, maybe this is a guy who can jumpstart his career. And uh, I, I liked him coming out of school. I think he's a good player. I think he's got a good skill set. But for whatever reason, it just really hasn't clicked in for him. But I wouldn't hate Brandon Bean taking a flyer on a guy like him, some kind of like one-year prove-it type deal. I think that's something that could work for, for both sides there. Um, Kendrick Bourne from the New England Patriots. Man, I really like this guy a lot. Uh, PFF projects him a two-year contract, $7 million average, eight and a half of that would be guaranteed. Uh, spot rack got him at three years, fourteen point six uh, million dollars. So between both sites, they're projecting him at three and a half to maybe five to six million. And the reason why is because Kendrick Bourne tore his ACL in Week Eight last year with the Patriots, who was having his best season of his career uh, before that. Not the most fluid athlete, doesn't have the greatest athleticism. But, you know, like PFF said in their description, they were describing him. He's got a real suddenness to his game. He's a good player, man. He can run after the catch. Uh, he's a real good blocker. He feels to me like a guy that could, would be a lot more expensive. If it wasn't for the ACL, he might be in that list of guys like Calvin Ridley that we talked about at the top here. Well, I don't think the Bills would have, you know, maybe like the Gabe Davis territory that, 11 or $12 million, maybe all the way up to 15 or 16 per year. I think that's what his value would be were it not for the ACL. So if they do that, obviously Brandon Bean um, would be taking a chance. And the Bills know ACL injuries, unfortunately, way too much over this past two years. So I'm not sure that they want to mess around with another guy who'd be coming off an ACL when there's other options. 
But what I'm saying is, man, oh man, the upside of getting a guy like Kendrick Bourne, I think if he was healthy, when he's healthy, in the right fit, in the right system, which I think he'd be a good fit for Buffalo, I think he could be a, a legitimate uh, number two receiver for the Bills. Uh, where are we at here? Quez Watkins, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. And by the way, we're down to our last handful here. Still young, 25 years old. Um, he's not that small, six foot, buck 93, a burner, 4.3540. So he's like a legit field stretcher, 15 catches, 142 yards in nine games with Philly last year. Obviously, those are not great numbers. My mindset is, you know, maybe you, you bring somebody like him in and then you dump Deontay Hardy. You could probably get him for cheaper than what the Bills are on the hook for with um with Deontay Hardy. I don't really got too much to add to that. That's just if you want to change things up. If you kind of want to say Deontay was was a disappointment last year and you think you could do better, maybe Quez uh, Watkins um, is that guy. Donovan Peoples-Jones. This guy's a pretty good player, too. Spot Rack projects him one year, $2.78 million. Uh, he bounced between Cleveland and Detroit last year. But just two years ago, this guy was really good in Cleveland. 61 catches, 839 yards, three touchdowns. The big production potential is clearly there because, again, those numbers are just from two years ago. I could see him being another guy who, who the Bills bring in and kind of a, a one-year prove-it type deal. A guy who, best-case scenario, can upgrade the position. He's not going to really influence how you feel about the position going into the draft. But again, I, I just, man, I keep going back to, to Trent Shurfield and just the measuring stick to upgrade to me has got to be Trent Shurfield. Like that needs to be the floor. The ceiling for anybody that you bring in should be Gabe Davis plus 15% because I still think Gabe Davis is a pretty damn good receiver and his loss is going to be felt on the bills. But your floor is Trent Shurfield. Your ceiling is Gabe Davis plus maybe 15%. And I feel the floor of Donovan Peoples-Jones is better than what you got from Trent Shurfield this past season. So I'm all in to go out. Not all in, but I would like to see the Bills go out and sign him. And in fact, to be honest with you, over these last handful of names that we've talked about here, Quez Watkins and Kendrick Bourne, only because of the injury in LaVisca, La uh, Chanel, Van Jefferson even. As I'm talking about it and remembering back to two years ago with the Cleveland Browns, I think Donovan Peoples-Jones would actually be a, a damn good signing. All right, I got one more and then I got a bonus. Coming in last here, and I got to admit it, I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty weary because of the team he's coming from, the Miami Dolphins, and because Trent Shurfield the year before that was the third wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins, but Cedric Wilson, again, despite being a little wary of him because of him being Miami's three and going through the same process a year ago with Trent, 22 catches, 295 yards, three touchdowns last year. He was good in Dallas two years ago before he got paid with uh, Miami. Caught 45 balls in, in Dallas in 2021. Made 602 yards, six touchdowns. I mean, that is really, really good potential number four uh, production. Is he better than Trent Shurfield, though? I guess that's the question. Did Trent Shurfield just have a bad year? Did Trent Shurfield not get used enough? Is it his fault? Is it the, the, the organization's fault? I, mean, I know it's his fault that he dropped two passes in the game against Kansas City. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like with Cedric Wilson, you kind of get into that apples and oranges versus the floor. Like I said, the floor with Trent Shurfield. But personally, me, I, I would rather have um, I'd rather have Cedric Wilson. And then I want to bring up one more guy. I kind of we'll call him a bonus. I said 10, but I lied. I got 11. So KG Osborne, Minnesota Vikings. This guy might be too much money, though. So that's kind of why I got him as a bonus. Uh, Spot Rack has him in two years, 15.5 million. So about a seven and a half uh, million average. Feel like with, with, with KG Osborne, the potential's high. Like he has a ceiling to me 
in the right situation in Buffalo, the right circumstance where he could be a guy who could put up like relatively legitimate number two receiver numbers. He can make plays, pretty good playmaker. Um, I think when he had opportunities in Minnesota, I mean, he was buried last year behind the best receiver in the NFL. And then also a first round pick, uh, Addison out of USC. So he was a three receiver for Minnesota with a bigger role. Can he be a more impactful player? I had 48 catches last year, 540 yards, three touchdowns. Problem with uh, KG Osborne, which will give you pause, is that he had seven drops last season. So that's not good. But he only had two drops in the two seasons uh, before that. So anyway, I, I think he's a possibility. And there you go. Those are 10 wide receivers. For people out there wondering, I feel like maybe I missed somebody, but I feel like for the most part between the 10 or actually 11 guys that we dove into a little bit, plus the guys that I mentioned that I just think are going to be um, too expensive and a handful of guys that I just personally, in my own personal taste, like Beckham, I just, I don't want. But I am pretty much, you know, I, I, pretty, I think I pretty much covered the wide receiver group for this year. So if you're looking at free agents, this is pretty much what you're going to have. Now, of course, Brandon Bean could just as easily find a, a wide receiver target, maybe one with good contract, good term, and trade. That's always a possibility. And I think no matter what they do, no matter what, if the Bills are to sign any one of these players that we talked about today, again, I still think that they're going to use a draft pick no later than the end of night two. Um, in the NFL draft. All right. Anyway, that's going to do it for the show. Thank you very much as always for locking in. I will be back with a brand new episode tomorrow. Talk to you then.